Hi, and welcome to the Haddonfield United Methodist Church Weekly Sermon Podcast. For more information about us or anything you hear in this episode, be sure to visit HaddonfieldUMC.org. We hope that this and every episode can help sustain you on the journey as together we seek to put our faith into action. Hi friends, welcome to our sermon podcast here at Haddonfield United Methodist Church. My name is Reverend Chris Heckert, and the sermon today is the third in our New Thing sermon series. How do you find hope in the face of bad news? Or maybe you've waited for good news that just hasn't come. The people of ancient Israel asked this question. How can we sing songs of the Lord in a foreign land? God answers to the prophet Isaiah. Sing to the Lord a new song, for I am about to do a new thing. Can you perceive it? Whether we feel it, sense it, or believe it, God is always doing a new thing to heal hurts, open up new possibilities, and restore brokenness. Join us this October as we proclaim new thing. God is doing a new thing. Can you perceive it? The first text today comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 8. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines. But you shall be called priests of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of our God. You shall enjoy the wealth of the nations and in their riches you shall glory. Because their shame was double, and dishonor was proclaimed as their lot, therefore they shall possess a double portion. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Well, God is doing a new thing. Can you perceive it? Our God is a God of renewal, of forgiveness, of restoration, of reshaping. Or like Richard Rohr says in his book, The Wisdom Pattern, God is a God of order, disorder, and reorder. For the Jews living in captivity in Babylon, to which the prophet Isaiah is writing in this text, God's new thing was literally returning them to the home of their ancestors, where their parents and grandparents would have lived. They would get to go back to their ancestral homeland and rebuild the city of Jerusalem, rebuild the walls and the temple, to rebuild a society that would be built on justice and order where people would live together in harmony and peace. This is a society where the hungry are fed, where the suffering find relief, and where the captives are made free and can go home. The new thing, as Isaiah says, is to give them a garland instead of ashes, oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. The prophet Isaiah is saying to those who are in captivity that God was about to do this new thing 
and restore them to prosperity, to live in harmony among the people. Now, the prophets of the Hebrew Bible have kind of a twofold job, memory and vision. The first is that they hold for the people of Israel memory, and they remind the people who God is and what God has done for them. Prophets often say, remember. Remember what God has done and that God is good. And here, Isaiah is leaning into that second sacred task, which is to hold for the people a vision, a new vision, to cast a vision for what God will do and is about to do, and specifically what God would do if they are faithful to the task that God has given them. And here, God will restore, because it says, the work of grieving and the work of paying for the sins of previous generations is behind them. They have gone from order to disorder, and now God is about to reorder, to do something new, this beautiful thing, a garland, a sign of celebration instead of ashes, which are a sign of grief and of loss. The new thing that God does for them is restoration, rebuilding, restoring. Well, they say that actions have consequences, and the prophets also remind us that faithfulness also has consequences that when we are faithful, God does something through that. And when we invest in good things, when we plant seeds and are faithful to the cycles of life, there are also positive consequences to those things. Although it often takes time for those things to bear fruit, whether it's literally planting a seed or doing the right thing or rebuilding a relationship or making amends for harm and for wrongdoing. Faithfulness also has consequences. And so here, the people of, of Judea who were living in Babylon have planted their seeds. They have made amends to God. They have lived faithfully with one another and peaceably, and now God is about to restore them. Well, I just want to take a moment and review the trajectory of God's people. On Monday nights, I've been teaching a class on the Torah. And if you look at the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, you see this beautiful story that takes place over hundreds of years. Um, and it looks like it goes very quickly, although obviously it's in slow motion. But the trajectory of God's promise, first God speaks to Abraham, who is living far away from what is today Israel and, and in that day, Palestine. And God speaks to Abraham, who's a nomad, and says, I will be your God, and I will bless you, and I will give you a nation. And so then Abraham's grandson, who is Jacob, is called Israel because he wrestles with God. He's been a scoundrel to his brother Esau, and God meets him in the wilderness, and he wrestles and touches his hip, and he limps. And so he gets this name, the one who wrestled with God, Yisrael. And Jacob then has up to 70 descendants who end up in Egypt. 400 years later in the book of Exodus, those descendants have turned into a nation, but they've become enslaved. And one who almost died named Moses, who survived by the faithfulness of his sister and mother, Moses becomes the unlikely one to work with God to free God's people. And they go from a new thing, a good thing, to a bad thing. And then God does a new thing, which is saves them from slavery. But then pretty soon they find themselves lost. And again, they are faithless. They don't trust God. They don't trust Moses. And they wander in the wilderness for generations, for 40 years. And then God gives them a gift, a covenant, a way to live in prosperity. And that covenant is all about revering and loving God and loving one another, not exploiting or taking from one another. And last week, Pastor Jason preached on the Ten Commandments, and this is the core of that covenant. Well, in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that covenant is expanded into 613 some 
laws or codes that help us to understand how do we put that harmony into action. And it's really all about a society in which people can thrive without living under oppression of human rulers. Well, after the Torah was written and people lived into that in the time of judges, there eventually were kings who broke that covenant, who exploited God's people, who stole property from their own people to expand their vineyards and palaces. And eventually, Israel and Judah were broken up and they were conquered by other people. So we see throughout history that when God wants a loving relationship in which the people can thrive and flourish, it's human selfishness and human division and greed that breaks that up. And so when God is doing a new thing, it is always to let the dust settle from faithlessness and then to give humans another chance because God is a God of grace and love and forgiveness and reconciliation. Well, I want to read a second text that I'm holding somewhat in concert with this first one from Isaiah. This comes from Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, that's Jesus, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So here, Jesus is a rabbi, an interpreter, and a teacher of the law, of the Torah specifically. And so Jesus' interpretation of the 613 mitzvot, or commandments, is that they are detailed extrapolations of these two commandments that really undergird everything. And the first comes from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love God with all your heart and all your mind and with all of your soul. And so while you may have heard this text over and over again that Jesus calls us to love God and love our neighbor, I want to point to the fact that what Jesus is saying to the lawyers of his day who are challenging him and trying to get him to fall into a pit is that for him, what he is seeing in that day and age, that they are also living in a time of great disorder. The Romans have occupied Israel in the north and also Judea in the south. And under Roman rule, they their economy is not good. Their society is not good. They are not free to live on their own will, but they are oppressed with taxes and military rule. And what is happening is the religious rulers are kind of debating and arguing as to who's to blame and what is going to free them from Roman rule. And it usually comes back to which laws, whose order, whose version of political freedom is the better one. And what Jesus is pointing to is it's not the, the absolute importance as to which sacrifice is made or the ritual hand washing or even of purification rites or all the other rules, but the ones that get thrown out first are the ones that describe who God is. Well, there are three qualities of God in the Hebrew Bible. They come up over and over and over. And those three qualities are that God is righteous, God is just, and God is loving kindness. This word chesed that goes together. You can say kind, you can say loving, but it really goes together, more like compassion. God is righteous, holy, without blame. God is just. There are consequences to human actions and that God wants us to live justly, and God is also compassionate and calls us to be just. So just as God is those three things, God wants us humans to be those three things. And if you look at the covenant with Moses that I talk about in the Torah, it is all about us holding up our end of the bargain, 
just as God is righteous, just, and loving kind, we are called to seek righteousness, to live justly, and most important, to live in loving and kind relationship with one another. Way back in the time of Isaiah, when Isaiah is saying that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him to proclaim good news and that God is about to do a new thing and restore, it is the consequence of faithfulness. And it is the opportunity for loving relationship to restore their prosperity. And in the same way, Jesus is is pointing, just like Isaiah does, to the people in their day, that if they can focus less on who is following the law and more on who is living out the spirit of God's righteousness, justice, and loving kindness, that they too could be sowing the seeds for restoration and for God's new thing. Well, today we are living also in a time which all three seasons may coexist, order, disorder, and reorder. But there's a lot of reordering happening in our world. And the question is, which version do we invest in? Do we invest in the version that protects ourselves and what we want and our preferred future? Or if we are truly the disciples of Jesus, how do we invest in what God wants from us? Righteousness, to lay aside the things that harm our relationship with God and one another. Justice, to invest in a just society and to live in right relationship with one another. Cornell West, a scholar, often says that justice is what love looks like in public. And most important, as Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. It's more than just a way to live. It's a way to invest in God's new order. So as we seek to live in whatever new thing God is doing, think about this. We can invest in that in which serves us, or we can invest in that which serves God's vision of righteousness, justice, and loving kindness. What are the things that we need to lay down? The selfishness that we need to turn away from and the ways that we can invest forgiveness healing, love, compassion, mercy, and reconciliation into the world. When we do that, we are investing into God's preferred future. We're not just being nice, we're kind, but we are, as a couple weeks ago I said, seek the welfare of the city, and there you will find your welfare, as the prophet Jeremiah says. Seek the welfare of the people you have now, of the places that you have now, Invest in them, love them, just as you love God in your life now, and God will build for you a new thing that is just, that is righteous, and that is loving and kind. Friends, I'm grateful for you. God is doing a new thing. Can you perceive it? Let us invest in it today by loving God and one another. And together we are the church in a hurting world. Amen. Thanks again for listening. For more information about us or anything you heard in this episode, be sure to visit HaddonfieldUMC.org. Through today's scripture and message, we pray that you find strength to go deeper into love of God and neighbor as we work together to be the church in a hurting world.